So, Terry, I'd like to begin with your first encounters with the piano. Um, how old were you and where were you at the time? I was in uh, Weimar, California. Uh, well, let's say it wasn't my first encounter with the piano because when I was a little kid, whenever my parents would take me to a house that had a piano in it, I, that would be where I'd spend my time. But I didn't know how to play piano, but I was fascinated by the piano and I would sit at it and, you know, make sounds. But I, um, I was living in Weimar, California, which is not too far from where I live now, up in the uh, Sierra Nevada foothills. And uh, I started taking piano lessons at the age of eight there. And it was on a chicken farm and your grandmother drove yeah. you? Tell us about my, that. Well, my grandmother would always prepare a big Sunday dinner. She was a great Italian cook. And she would, never knew who was coming, but there'd always be like 20 or so people would show up. Mm -hmm. And she'd make raviolis and fried zucchini and fried chicken and all this stuff and, and just serve all these people. Some of them were just friends of friends, but she always, they always knew there would be a great dinner there. And I'd go ride with her down to get the chickens and she got them live. So I'd have the piano lesson while she went and got the ch live chickens and then I'd ride in the back of the seat of her Plymouth, 34 Plymouth <laughs> with these smelly <laughs> chickens <laughs> back to Weimar. Did you like your teacher? Uh, I, you know, I don't have a real strong memory, uh, but I, I really liked having lessons and learning about the piano. Mrs. Halton was uh, uh, pretty old by then. She was probably not quite as old as I am now, but you know, she was probably 75 or something. Gave me the basic, you know, basics of put your thumb under. <laughs> That kind of thing, and uh, started me on simple little tunes. And then you had a cousin, Dickie, who could play by ear, right? So he right. would hear something on the radio and then just be able to reproduce yeah, it? Yeah, Dickie was, uh, and he liked to improvise, and he liked to improvise like on, uh, you know, Brahms Hungarian Dance Number no. 5 and things like that, and he would make his own version of them. And then I would try to copy him, whatever he had learned, because he was, for, he was about six years older than me and had been playing a lot longer. But he never had lessons. He never learned to read music. And he still plays. I mean, he's like, uh, I think, uh, probably almost 90 now. And he still uh, still does the same thing. He learns things off the radio by ear and plays them. <laughs> I just think this is so interesting that most of us do either play notated music, like we have piano lessons and play notated music, or start to improvise at a young age. But you were doing both early on. I mean, they all, it seems like they always went kind of yeah. hand in hand. I had a little more trouble with notated music. Uh, I, I mean, I, I really liked it because it introduced me to like the music of Bach and, you know, this been, which I would have never been able to figure out on, by ear. Uh, and it was really exciting to, uh, you know, as, as I started, we moved to Reading after Weimar and I got a teacher who was starting to give me more classical music, uh, like Bach and uh, Mozart. Yeah, and it probably also helps later on with notating music. I mean, yeah. when you started writing it down. But I still have, I think, a preference to not read music. I've always had a little bit of problem eye coordination with hand. I mean, I, I do it, but it, it's, I'm not fl so fluent in it as most of my colleagues are, you know, who can sit down and sight read a Beethoven sonata or something. You know, I, I, I don't, I, I've always had trouble with that. So I, I prefer, that's why I think I became an improviser. And you've also said that about your own music, that if you had the score to, yeah, you know, one of your <laughs> <laughs> that reading true. it from the page, I think it's Charlie true. Parker said that also. Like if you, if he had to actually read yeah. the score for what, you know, an improvisation, wouldn't necessarily. I just had this problem in Nashville with a symphony, you know, I wrote this score, organ concerto, which is quite complex, but I wrote it, I didn't write it in real time, of course, you, you know, and then when it goes by really fast, uh, I have to, uh, the conductor's much faster at reading it than I am. <laughs> so when he's asking me questions, I'm kind of like, mm. <laughs> 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 what measure was that? <laughs> so then your father came back from the war Right? He was away for three years, I think. And you were taking 
classical piano lessons, but you were also playing with a group called Granddad's Copycats. Right, that and, was in Redding, California. And what kind of music did you play with them? Uh, well, we had, you know, we were, I was in a little band. And, uh, there was a drummer and a violinist and me playing piano. And uh, there, were, uh, there were kids my age, we were all about, 10, I think, 8 10? to 10, 10, 11, 12. And, uh, you know, they, the kids had different talents. They danced, some of them dances or acrobats or whatever they were doing, and we would play music for them, uh, make it up, you know. Or if they had a song, we'd try to learn the song and, and accompany them. And then I had a, uh, a duo with a drummer called Tin Pan Alley, and we would play, uh, you know, uh, 1930s, I'll be down to get you in a taxi, honey, and this kind of stuff. <laughs> That's such great training. I mean, it's just so great for everything you did later on. Well, and... the, the the organizer, I thought, was one of these really rare, unique persons that, that kids loved. They would do anything for him. His name is Walter Ray. And he took us all over Northern California and had us perform. So we, even though we didn't have great skills, we got a lot of performance practice, you know, playing in front of an audience and and uh, get, got to travel with music. And it made me love the idea of being a musician, you know, that, that got the feeling of traveling and playing music at, at, at an early age. Yeah. And some of those songs had a specially strong left hand, because I always think of you as like your left hand is so strong. And I love it when you're playing and you just do left hand stuff for a while. Yeah, well, uh, I like to play uh, boogie woogie and stuff like that when I was a kid. And, uh, be, you know, I was listening to Mead Lux Lewis. And, to Mead Lux Lewis? Yeah, people, you know, so that, that was, that's a left hand oriented music. And so I think that's where the, a lot of that comes from. Yeah. Just left hand ostinato. Uh -huh. Essentially, so that's what I do, except it developed into the kind of thing where I finally decided to let the left hand go on its own instead of being always stuck on a ostinato and see if it could think on its own while I'm playing the right hand. Can you show us some left hand ostinato or? Well, I, there's, I mean, I have a lot of, a lot of my own, but I'm Rain Rainbow Curveras, you know. So, that, you know. And what kind of pattern can you show us how yeah, that, like, uh, how many? It's, it's uh, seven beats. With seven beats. It's broken down into six and eight. Six. And the second, ta second part of it is a variation of that. Which is the eight part. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Did it take you a while to learn, I mean, to be able to do that? To do that at up to up to speed? Uh, well, I, not so long, because once I got the idea, um, the hard thing was, you know, if you're doing this. In different places in canons. So that's what I used to practice doing a lot. If you start like on the first. Here's on the first beat. So, uh, so you get so that you can start anywhere, you know, on the fourth beat or the sixth beat. So and that's how Rainbow was constructed in the studio, as I was uh, using the same pattern, but it would be kind of this revolving orb, you know, depending on where you start the. And I, of course, had multi-tracking, so there are many versions of the pattern going on. And so in the studio, did you play like that? Did you play both hands at the same time? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I did it in eight tracks, so there's quite a few versions of it going on at the same time. Yeah. So you have a piece called 1516 that um, is not written down, but it's on your Lisbon concert album. Right. So how did... That's, that seems very difficult to play. I remember being at the 92nd Street Y when you played that, and there was a guy somewhere near me who said, who was trying to count, and he was like, how, what, how, what is the beat? And I just said, you know, oh, it's 15, 16. But how do you, um, is that very difficult to do? 
Well, I mean, I, I, I practice, you know. <laughs> it doesn't come from heaven. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I mean, it is. It is it's difficult to improvise over. Uh -huh. And how do you think of it? Do you just leave out one of the sixteenths? Uh, no, I thought it was a pet. Actually, five groups of three. So the the if you if you think of it as five times, but it's not constructed in threes. It's eight and seven. Each one has this. This one is more in three. Two, three, four, five. Two, three. I, I'm not, I'm, I haven't played this for a long time. So <laughs> it's so great. It's such a great piece. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back. Um... It's actually, a, it was, you know, it's, uh, first I wrote it as a string quartet for Kronos. Really? Yeah. So if you if you listen to uh, the the ecstasy, oh. that quartet, it's in there. It's called at the summit. So uh, first I wrote it, you know, for string quartet, and then I thought, well, I want to play it too. <laughs> that, that's happened with a lot of my my music. I've written it first for Kronos, and then I, or the opposite way, Salome. I uh, I actually was a solo piano piece, and then I. First part of Salome, Dances for Peace. Uh, I was playing as a piano piece, and then I orchestrated it for string quartet. I only ask you if it's hard because I remember you talking about um, doing these patterns as a kind of morning meditation, and that you would start the morning with with working on this. And I, yeah. I just, you know, was interested in your well keyboard studies. You know, the keyboard studies would get, would got me started. Just four notes using the four note pattern, you know, as rep as a meditation, and listening to it. What was the four note pattern? This, this one. You play it. I think. Can become a drone. I never knew that you used sostenuto pedal. I do this all I mean, the time. The, uh, the sostenuto pedal, yeah. pedal for me, in my music, is the one of the, the most important one because it, it creates the drone notes. Yeah. I didn't realize that. So when you travel, do you always ask for a piano with a really I always make sure it works pedal? before I play the concert because sometimes you run into a piano and then you have to get call a tuner back. Hey, but it's not working and I need it. Yeah. Yeah. So keyboard studies, um, it, this is 1964, 1965? Yeah, 1965, I think. And there's one of them on the cover. This is one version on the cover of your yeah, collective piano playing. works. So yeah. how do you play something like this? Well, this, is a, this was just trying to work with um, um, conceptual art. You know, I was with part of Plexus at, at one point. So think of this as a stadium. Stadium. And these are people, ah. and they're all they're all in the round, right? Oh. And and so this this is the inner circle in the stadium, see, if, or, or coliseum, or some round space, right? Where they're all maybe there's one here in the middle. Oh, that's not quite round out there, but this one. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have singers or horns? In circular things, all going round at, in different speeds, using the same four-note pattern. See, did I actually make the four 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 notes? Uh, I haven't looked at this for a while. 
because it also has, uh, you know, it, it, it transposes too, so yeah. Mm -hmm. basic thing to make uh, polyrhythms out of it. And there are different... Um, there... I don't, 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 did I not, ever notate those? Uh, some of them I never notated. The keyboard studies? Yeah, oh, I mean, the... All, the, all the different possibilities. Oh, this is the first one. This is, That's uh, the first one. And this one I never play as, as it's written. But I, I play an improvisation on it. Uh, so were this these... is the one we're talking about. Oh, number two? Yeah. So these were not... So this one is a real early version, which I did for John Cage's notations. John... So here's number two. So you had been playing these, I mean, you had been sort of improvising on these kinds of patterns for a while, but um, then you wrote it down for when John Cage asked you for a con contribution yeah, for he notations. Wanted, he had that and notations that was, book. So. And that was graphic scores? Was uh, I, I don't have a copy of the notations yeah. book, and I can't remember what all was in it anymore. I had it one time and disappeared from my library. But um, but he asked you for a but score. I think everything was pretty much a graphic. Yeah, he asked me for a score, so that's what I was working on at the time. So I, And that's what most pianists find there's a lot of bootleg copies that have been recopied and... Oh, they find notations? You mean they find the score for notations or they find... Uh, this was, I'm talking about before this was ever notated. I had just the John Cage, the keyboard study number two. This number one wasn't notated for a long time. Mm. Wasn't in the notations book, just the keyboard study number two was in the notations book. So it was only one, mm. one page. And... Um... And that's where like John Tilbury and people like that play from that page. From that one page? Yeah, which is fine. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of an event piece. So there are lots and lots of different versions, I mean, of, of performances because... So this one has the, what I was just demonstrating there is that I, just so that people would have an idea that you could have a lot of different length patterns out of that. And then what are you doing with your left hand while you're doing this? Well, you do. You can do the same, the the same, same thing, yeah. yeah. Or you can just keep one. You know, you can keep. You just take the first. Thing. So it's five against five, five and five no, it's not five against four. It's so it's five times four, twenty. Five times four? 20, yeah, so if it takes five times to do this against four times this. So they line up every... Yeah. Yeah. So you just multiply that if it's seven against four, you know.
haven't done this for a while, so I'm messing it a bit. So this was this was 1965, and you still when you when you improvise today, when you do a concert today, you still use similar patterns, don't you? Well, you know, the um, like the Persian Sergi dervishes and sending moonshine dervishes are all built out of these, but with more improvisation, melodic improvisation. But they're the core of both of those pieces. So let's go back to um, high school, to because <laughs> I'm so curious about your early years and you know playing playing classical music. You met Dwayne Hampton right mm -hmm. in high school, and he was really influential in your life. So tell us. Still alive. Is he really? Yeah, I, I I did. Gian and I did a concert at the Shasta Theater in Reading uh, about uh, four years ago, I think. Four years, and, and at least he was then, and he he wasn't that much older than me. He. Uh, I was probably about five or six years older, but he'd just come back from the Curtis Institute, and uh, I heard about him, and I, of course, didn't have a real good piano teacher then, and, and went to Dwayne. And, this was uh, in high school? Yeah, I was in high school, oh. and Dwayne was just out of Curtis, so. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a wonderful pianist himself, and a, a very good teacher. I mean, he would, and, uh, you know, cult, uh, Reading is it, in the. This is we're talking about Reading in 1950s. It is a logging, mining town, and uh, very culturally deprived. And very, the only thing they would have is visiting uh, once in a while. What is it called? Uh, can't remember now. But it was an association that would invite Vronsky and Babine and different you know people to to the high school uh, to perform. Mm. And that's only, and I didn't had no way of getting to San Francisco or hearing, you know, I could only get a few recordings and, and to really hear what was going on in the world. So I was pretty much in the dark, and Dwayne was my beacon, you know, and he was showing me, because he'd been to Curtis and showing me, introduced me to John Cage, he introduced me to Bartok, to, you know, the things that. And we also forget there wasn't, I mean, we don't forget, but there wasn't obviously YouTube and you couldn't, you know, use the internet. No, and it was even hard recordings. to get recordings, you know. I remember Life magazine came out with a, our article on Charlie Pork, Parker, and I think it was around 19, we subscribed to Life magazine, and, and oh, I, I was really excited. This is Charlie Parker, what is Bebop, you know? <laughs> and uh, this is a 1945 issue of Life magazine. And uh, so look, looking for trying to find a Charlie Bar Parker recording in Reading was, you know, was, and there was no, you know, like you say, there was no internet. There was, and, and we didn't have television then. In fact, I never had television. I, 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 I missed the whole age of television. I've never owned a television set. Really? And uh, the, the, that was even before television. <laughs> But I did listen to the radio a lot, and I still like radio over tele. You know, mm. I don't like to watch television, but I like to listen to the radio. So Dwayne Hampton, did he have a particular? Did you work with him on sound or tone or? A lot, a lot like on that? tone, uh, and he was studying at the same time with Adolf Baller in San Francisco, who was a wonderful pianist, Viennese pianist. Yes, legendary. Yeah, Adolf and uh, yeah. so Dwayne was learning from Baller. And I was getting kind of through Dwayne uh, Baller's technique of, of hand, which was a very quiet kind of uh, playing, motion, uh, economical playing, mm -hmm. but really trying to get the tone of the piano. You know, when I was doing this, that's how you try to get feel the sound down through the keys. Mm -hmm. Dwayne really emphasized that, no matter what you were playing. And, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that was, came from Bala too. Bala's hands were just, I love to watch his hands on the keys because it didn't look like, it's kind of like Art Tatum. You hear all this incredible music coming out, but the hands are hardly, <laughs> they don't look like they're moving much. You know, it was so economical. And you know, it, uh, Bala had been um, picked up by the Nazis and they broke his hands, broke the bones in his hands. So he had to totally re, uh, had numerous operations had to relearn to play. And it turned him into a chamber music player with the Alma Trio. Right. He, he actually stopped being a soloist, but he was a great soloist before the, yeah. that. 
And I heard it was it was intentionally because he was a great pianist, and they knew that, and so they they did that as an act of malice. Yeah, just uh, cruelty. Yeah. You know, just like people are today in war, they, they do things out of cruelty. Yeah. But he he could have been a soloist because he used to play. Uh, I was studying Beethoven's 109 with him at that time. And he was playing it so amazingly, you know, that I, I'd go away from my lessons, like, you know. That's funny. You have a, a part in the um, Fandango on the Heaven Ladder where you go, da 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 And I always think, oh, it's the last movement of the Tempest Sonata by Beethoven. Yeah. But I don't think you no, consciously of that, but... do things like that. And there's another. But I'm part... sure things come out. You know, I mean, I, I studied enough classical music that it gets inside. And... Yeah, because in uh, Venus in '94, you have the B A C H motif. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but again, maybe it's not. Maybe it's somewhere somewhere in your yeah. subconscious. Well, that's in a lot of music. <laughs> so also in high school, you met Ralph Wadsworth, who mm -hmm. introduced you to a lot of 20th century music and the Bartok. Music for Strings, Piano, and Celeste. Yeah. And you wrote your first composition for the Shasta, Shasta High School students, is that right? Right. Uh, he was writing a musical for, uh, for the Shasta High School students. I think that was my senior year. And, uh, you know, he knew I was, uh, he, he was really a mentor, even more than Duane, in terms of like just overall music. And he was a vocalist and a violinist, and I, I really liked that. He was, you know, that I was interested in singing, but I never considered myself a singer at that time. I was just in the choir. But um, he asked me to write a song for the musical, so I did. And, um, and at that this, was my first, uh, yeah, my first composition. Your first composition, and you wrote it down. Yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah. Um, and. You were also listening to jazz at this point. What jazz pianists were you? Yeah, a little to? bit. Um, you know, my first real love was er Errol Garner, mm. who was actually kind of a protege of Art Tatum's. I mean, Earl Garner used to go and listen to Art Tatum all the time. And then I later discovered Art Tatum. But, but Errol Garner was more popular than, I mean, he was like, you could hear Errol Garner on the radio all the time, even on non-jazz stations. And uh, I love the spirit of Earl Garner, and I still do. I'd love to listen to Earl Garner. I think he's still one of the great American pianists. What was it about his playing that you were taken with? It's the spirit. I mean, he's just like make, lifts your spirit up. He, he was so buoyant. He was so, uh, Earl's music is very happy. It's very, uh, but in a deep way, not just, you know, ha ha ha. It's, you know, it just takes you up. Did you ever? Hear him live? No, I never did. Yeah. No. Yeah. But I heard a good story about him. He used to play in Las Vegas, and uh, you know he's very short stat in stature. And uh, I heard an interview on the radio, and he said, uh, he said, yeah, I had to put like two of those uh, New York t telephone books on the piano bench to get me up. <laughs> 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 Two of those babies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, then I, you know, from then I, I started listening to, you know, as many as many jazz pianists as I could. But it was mainly after I'd moved to the Bay Area and had more access to, you know, then I started hearing Thelonious Monk and Bill Evans and Thelonious Monk, yeah. Yeah, Thelonious Monk. Uh, when I when I studied at San Francisco State, I was in a really wonderful class with Pauline Oliveras. Lauren Rush, Joe Weber, Ken Benchoff, you know, this was, these are all people who went on to have a really great career in music. And we were all in this class with Dr. Wendell Lodi, who was a wonderfully stimulating teacher and inter introduced us to all kinds of, not only, you know, new music stuff, but jazz. And so we got, we got to, to uh, get acquainted with things that maybe wouldn't have stumbled into otherwise. And, uh, so this was before you went to UC Berkeley? Yeah. I was in San Francisco State. At, I came there in 1955 to 57. And then soon after that, you wrote the two pieces um, for piano, 1958-1959, which are 12-tone pieces. Yeah. 
So that is well, well, that really happened, interesting. That happened because uh, Lauren Rush was was Lauren and Pauline were writing in more uh, twelve. 12 tone style, at least that's maybe not strict 12 tone music. But, uh, and I was hanging out with them a lot. And I was more of a Pulak, Neo, uh, I love neoclassical music. And was, the writing I was doing was that. So uh, I was, uh, uh, I'd gotten married in the meantime and Anne got pregnant with Colleen. And so I didn't, continue going to school. I went to work for United Airlines, but I was writing on my off hours. So I started those pieces when I was writing. But before I started it, Lauren had asked me um, to play a piano piece of his at, at Wheeler Hall on a student recital. And it was kind of like Schoenbergian uh, piece, very much uh, in the style of early, uh, Schoenberg's early piano music. And that kind of uh, got into my psyche and fingers. And right after that, I wrote the, the two pieces for piano, which aren't really so much like Lawrence music, uh, but it, it opened something up into me to want to explore these kinds of angular rhythms and dancey, you know, things that... They're kind of Webern-like, actually. I mean, I, I think of it as as Webern, very like these hairpin crescendos and, you know, mezzo forte and then pianissimo and and um, yeah I mean it, it it's so different from mm -hmm. it's funny that you say that because I, I wasn't really as much into Weber's music but I was getting I was thinking more of uh, I was really interested in Schoenberg and quickly after that I started getting into Stockhausen ah. and uh, which is not like this either but uh, I I sort of made that leap and started listening to Stockhausen's music. And there's a recording of you playing this, which is really brilliant. And yeah, I think that was from um, a student symposium huh. at uh, UCLA. But you never performed them again. No, <laughs> I don't have them in my fingers now. I hope. Did you play? You are you playing them? Yeah. Oh great. I recorded them. Yeah. Oh great. Well, yeah. I get to hear them again. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, and just a couple years later, you wrote the, you were writing the keyboard studies, which is just kind of such a very different, um, almost opposite part of the spectrum. Well, I was playing with a uh, rehearsal band in San Francisco. A lot happened to me between this and then. I've been in Europe two years. I met Chip Baker, I worked with him, and I uh, came back to San Francisco and started playing with a rehearsal jazz band with uh, Bill Douglas, John Gibson, uh, Mel Martin, these wonderful Bay Area jazz musicians. And we rehearse every Wednesday night. Yeah, and uh, we're playing uh, a lot of Monk and Coltrane and things like that. So uh, that's when I wrote Tread on the Trail. It was for that band. Yeah. Because uh, I thought of it more of a jazz piece. And uh, so, you know, a lot of things had happened. Uh, I, the Keyboard study number two, I remember that when it happened, we were playing Autumn Leaves in the uh, in this rehearsal band, and, I, and when I came to my solo, and you know, it's like... A... because that's sort of doing a, it's almost like an ornament within the texture of yeah. autumn leaves. And then I dropped out the rest of autumn leaves. <laughs> and then I wrote a piece called Autumn Leaves, which is, um, more than, uh, actually Robert Carl, uh, who wrote the NC book, did a wonderful performance of Autumn Leaves with a, with a group. Uh, it's not ever been done on commercial release, where I took the chords of Autumn Leaves and really stretched them way out and you hardly, you won't recognize the tune, but it's the underlying uh, That's amazing. Yeah. So at this point, were you also doing the, the late night concerts? 
the, or the all night concerts? Not yet. Not yet. I was still in San Francisco at this point. Working at the Tape Center, I got to do my first concerts at the Tape Center in November, and, and I think the next, the first one, that was when the premiere of NC was, and I, I played a version of, uh, of Keyboard Study 1 there, but you know, this. I started this kind of technique. Uh, so I played, and it was called Cool. And uh, I, uh, I did all the, ta the music for the gift with Chet Baker on that concert and a lot of tape things, uh, The Bird of Paradise, uh, things that Tom Wells later released on, uh, right. and some things he didn't release, you know, tape pieces. I was working with a lot of tape pieces. So, so I was still in San Francisco. So when you, when you played these on a keyboard, was it a piano or was it a synthesizer? What was it about? The piano, yeah. It was, it was on piano. Yeah. I had an old upright at home. And, and cool, was that like keyboard study number one? Was there a relationship? It, it was, that? but it uh, just in the fact the alternating hands, but it moves differently harmonically. And, and at this point, were you writing notated music or not? Um, not much, not much. I mean, I wrote I wrote Tread on the Trail. And uh, it was this one page thing. I was interested in writing charts that could be turned into really long pieces by musicians who knew how to work in extended forms. So you started notating music again in the 70s when you met the Kronos Quartet, is that right? Because 1980. And that was when David Harrington said, We want some quartets and could you write them down? Yeah. And then after that, you started notating also piano music. And you wrote this this beautiful album, The Heaven Ladder, Book 7. That yeah, that was quite a bit later. Uh, this is 1994, yeah. right? So, but tell us about The the Heaven Ladder. This is an Adolf Wolfley drawing. Yeah, The Heaven Ladder is, uh, that's, that's the Wolfley drawing uh, that inspired the title of the piece. I mean, that's just I like to the drawing. And what does the heaven ladder mean to you? Well, I think it's a wonderful thought that, you know, that uh, it's maybe a way to live that's, that's always ascending. You're becoming a finer, more pure person, and it's, a, it's reaching toward divinity. Wolfley was a very religious person. Maybe I'm not so religious, but I think I have a spiritual bent. Yeah. But Wolfley was deeply religious in the in the sense of um, God and the angels, and uh, he traveled with them in space. He was very divinely inspired, and he had to, he got these visions for God would take him to all these different planets, and and he he married twelve goddesses, and uh, he has this incredible autobiography that is of his imagination, but for him it was real. And you wrote an opera about him, right? Saying it all for him, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it isn't a really opera in the sense of, uh, 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 you know, operas that are even even modern operas. It's more. It's probably more like John John Cage's Your Opera or something. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's only loosely an opera. It's it's a theater piece with singing and a lot of narration, but a very small cast. There was only three of us on stage. But it did have a libretto, all taken from Wolfie's writings. And it had visuals done by Frank Ragsdale that were turned Wolfie's drawings into moving mandalas. And the fig little figures you see in his drawings actually were animated, and they started moving through the drawing. And so it was, a, it was quite a, I thought, a very uh, wonderful realization of Wolfie's work. We sort of collaborated with him mm -hmm. and with music and, and and his words created this, this thing, offering, which was performed about eight times. Wow, I hope, hope it can be performed again. Yeah. Well, we're all getting, uh, you know, this is 30 years ago, so. <laughs> so um, tell me about working with other keyboards besides the piano. When did that start happening? You worked with uh, a synthesizer and um, organ, you just, um, you're coming from a recording of your organ concerto, mm -hmm. um, and you've played the big organ at Disney Hall Disney and Hall, other yeah. other right organs. Even gave it a name. 
<laughs> what do you call it? It's called Hurricane Mama now. The name stuck. That's what I call it. I, I... Yeah. So how did that how did that happen? That you started Hurricane using Mama. well, oh. that you started using oh. other oh. keyboards besides uh, well, piano. Well, when I moved to New York, uh, I didn't have a piano. I, you know, I had a piano when I lived in San Francisco, and then in. Uh, 1965, Ann and Colleen and I went to Mexico for three months in a Volkswagen bus and drove all over Mexico and lived in the bus and ended up in New York. And I traded the bus for a loft on Grand Street. And uh, I didn't have a keyboard and I was really wanting something. And George Machunas, who's the founder of Fluxus, gave me an old harmonium that had a vacuum cleaner motor in it. So Reed Streams, which I was my first recording on Mass Art was done on the that old harmonium. And my mother loaned me enough money to buy a uh, couple of tape recorders and a soprano saxophone. And uh, I started doing concerts with the vacuum cleaner motor harmonium and uh, two tape recorders and the saxophone. Where were those concerts? Uh, well, that first one was in Philadelphia, Philadelphia College of Art. Jim McWilliams was the guy that came up with the idea to do an all-night concert. And uh, he said, could you do it? Could you play all night? I said, I'll you know, try it. So I, I did it with the saxophone and tape toys and, uh, and the harmonium. How did you, how did you, I mean, did you get sleepy? Did, well, how did you sustain I, there's yourself? There's a trick to it. I, I, would, uh, I would record. See, everybody came, they brought sleeping bags. They, Families came with picnic baskets. Uh, Jim wanted to make it a kind of family affair where people would spend the night. People had hammocks, uh, sleeping bags, everything strewn around the art gallery. Right? And uh, I would play a set, but I'd record the set. And the, of course, the, the tape delay stuff got recorded automatically as I was playing it. So then I would take a break while they were listening to the same set I just had played again. Then I'd come back and play a new set, record it all. So I didn't actually play continuously. Did you sleep during that? Did you no, take little no, naps no, or anything? I didn't, I didn't no? sleep. You just yeah. got a little rest. Yeah, I I'd sit out, you know. And why vacuum cleaner motor? What was special about that? It had a blower, which for the for the bellows. I guess somebody had made this for George, I think. And it had a noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so uh, when I don't know if you've ever heard this, it was recorded for Mass Art, which was a plastics company. And they made three or four records down. They were down on Canal Street in New York in '65, '66. Plastics company. Yeah. So they made all those Andy Warhol. Uh, that was the main thing they were selling was works that Andy had made out out of plastic, and then they made, mass produced them. So they were called Mass Art. <laughs> And they did an Alan Capra record and a John Cage record and my record and possibly one on Max Newhouse, mm. the Max Newhouse record. Those are the four I can remember. Mm. So that was the you know that was the first. A thousand, they, 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 we each we made a thousand records. And when when did you start playing organ? Uh, well, I was still in New York, and I uh, got a uh, Vox Supercontinental double manual organ. A step up from the vacuum cleaner uh, <laughs> harmonium. <laughs> and uh, uh, so then I did uh, concerts with, with this. Uh, I was still playing the saxophone. Poppy No Good and the Phantom Band was, was... I was playing Poppy No Good and the Phantom Band with the saxophone tape delay. Mm -hmm. And then I had, uh, the, I was playing mainly the keyboard studies then on the Vox Supercontinental. And that was my show. And I used to go, uh, I, I did the Interme Intermedia 68 tour, which was a bunch of New York artists were all um, doing the same kind of tour to colleges around New York, you know, Buffalo. And, and then was the organ portable so you could just bring it around with you? Yeah, I could lift it up and carry it then. <laughs> we don't have to do it now. Uh -huh. And I, I toured with Bob Benson, who was a New York uh, pop artist, and he had built a uh, whole bunch of screens of, out of mylar. And so uh, the, he surrounded me and part of the audience with mylar screens, which kind of looked like those, um, you know, uh, 
sideshow mirrors that where you look really distorted in, you know. So that, and he did the lights and the Mylar screens and I played and that was our show. We toured, toured New York State with that. And, but you really like playing big pipe organs now. Well, I, I don't get the opportunity to do it much and I'm not a trained pipe organist, but uh, the Disney Hall, uh, occasion was really great because Chad Smith, that was his, uh, I, I had been sitting next to Chad at a concert where an Arvo Pear organ piece was being played and I said, I'd love to play that organ and he took me seriously and, and uh, so he said, you know, we'll put you on the season, on the organ recital season and uh, I said, well, you know, I, I really am going to have to be able to have time with the organ. So I took I took some lessons from Phil Smith, who's the resident organist at, mm. at Disney Hall, to kind of get me started. Like, how, do you, how does this thing work? It's like flying a 747 and never <laughs> knowing what all the buttons and knobs were, you know. And uh, so Phil showed me enough to get me started. And uh, I, Chad gave me, I think, at least three weeks down there where I could have the hall from midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning, and nobody when it wasn't being used. So I did that. I must have had about 18 to 20 nights, because I was also composing the Universal Bridge for the organ. I was composing a piece for it. And uh, it was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had is being in Disney Hall all alone. Well, I wasn't all alone, because I invited a lot of friends. Calder Gortet came, and Russ Tamblin and his family, and people I knew in LA, and Michael McClure came down. People would sit and spend the night while I was rehearsing and writing in the hall. But to be in that hall all night, is, it's like a huge uplifting experience, like a big temple. You know, and that, but the pipe organ is so powerful, and you know, I never got tired of it. I, by the time six o'clock in the morning came, I was still ready to go more. You know, it was so energizing. What a wonderful experience. Yeah, it really was. I, I I've never had any any like it. I don't think I could do it again. The, the physical stamina and the, it was just came at the right time in my life. I was still you know strong and able to do things like that. I'd like to ask about your process of taking an improvisation and turning it into a composition. So if we take the piece, Be Kind to One Another. Mm -hmm. So um, you, that's a notated piece, but it began as improvisations. And uh, your grandchildren would sometimes ask for the music before they went to bed. And so it was sort of, in a way, a lullaby for them. Yeah, I wasn't and, even thinking of it as a piece. It was just something they liked to hear me play. So does that happen a lot, that you take material that you've been improvising and you then you turn it into a notated piece? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you play is so much more than what I, you know, what I played for them. It was just, you know, that's all I really had, you know, was that, that, that little theme at the beginning. And uh, then the little ragtime thing came, came into it later. And I started playing that and developing it. And then you asked me to write you a piece. And I also thought it was uh, a good idea, just a nice message. Because that's what Alice Walker had said when 9-11 happened. We have to learn to be kind to one another. Yeah. Now, this, this is a time when you have to learn to be kind to one another. And I thought that was the best thing I heard anybody say after 9-11. Yeah. And certainly now. Um, could you show us how you improvise on that? I haven't played that for so long, I'd be embarrassed yeah. <laughs> stumble in front of the cameras with it, but... Uh, do you think of the right hand and the left hand as having separate roles? Like, do you sort of think of them as individual entities in a way? Well, yeah, I mean, definitely, I think when I'm playing, I'm listening to the composite of what's happening and how to, what needs to be carrying the music at the time. So at times, it isn't just static. I mean, it's not, 
you know, even though it's repeating, it's thing, things are need to be brought out, but that's done spontaneously in the moment. Yeah, yeah. But you play that piece fantastically. You're the you're the master of that piece. Oh, I love that piece so much. But it is interesting your relationship between the right hand and the left hand because I think in you know the, a lot of the classical music we learn sort of the left hand has a very accompaniment role and the right hand is doing all the yeah. all the important stuff. Yeah. But you, the balance with you is very much, you know, equal or a lot of the left hand and maybe that comes from jazz and I mean the jazz pianist that you that you're inspired by. Well, I also think, uh, you know, I, I, I like to think about that when I'm writing with a string quartet. You know, a lot of string quartet, especially people who are first starting to write, they always think, well, the first violinist has the important part and everybody else is accompanying him. And I never wrote string quartets at that time. Sometimes the second violinist, I like to give the leading role to him. And a lot of times, like the Kronos, John Sherby gets to play the real cool stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so when you wrote in C, you were you had a job at the Gold Coast Saloon. Is Gold that Street what? Saloon. Gold yeah. Street Saloon. And what kind of music did you play there? I played, uh, you know, honky tonk. Uh, Can you sh show us what honky tonk is? <laughs> Let's see. Let me think about it a second. Um, well, it's it's mainly like you know you have this. Um, so I can kind of think of a tune that I want to play down. I haven't done any uh, of this kind of stuff for a while, but. Um... So great. And you know, that's another kind of music where if it's written down, like if I get a notated piece with yeah. that kind of bass, and it's really, really hard because you're, you know, you're trying to get this and you're trying to get that and you're trying to get everything accurate, and it sounds that way. But when someone just sits down, like. You see, I'm not getting it accurate. I'm just <laughs> well, or like when you hear Errol Garner yeah. play and it's just so natural. It's just like this kind of. Yeah, you have a lot of them. Yeah, or when Art Tatum plays, and it's just like he's leaping around, yeah. and he's blind, and he's probably had a lot to drink, but it's <laughs> like he's just sort of, he's just making, I mean, it's all, it's all just completely natural, I guess is what I'm saying, and when you play notated stuff like that, like some of your, some of your leaps in your, in your left hand, you know, you really have to, when they're notated, you have to really, they're not as natural sounding, I guess is what. What I'm trying to say, or you have to work yeah, hard to make them sound. Yeah, the spirit of it is it has to come from another place. That, that's why you have to go beyond the notation. And it, but the, and it was, you know, in the case of Art Tatum, the notation was not even an issue. It was, but he learned a lot of music from recordings. That's the way he learned. Oh, you know that. Yeah, oh, he he learned had to learn some way. You know, I mean, what he. But then he heard things in it that nobody had heard before, like harmonic. Uh, you know, substitutions. He was one of the first ones that, in fact, I think he's hardly been equaled in harmonic substitution even to this day. Like, it, where his ear led him. I still listen to when I listen to this thing, I marvel at. And Herbie Hancock said this will never catch up with Arteta. <laughs> If Herbie thinks that way. <laughs> and Vladimir Horvitz said, I'd give my right arm for his left hand. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you ever work with Pandit Pranath at the piano? Yes. You did? In fact, uh, it, unfortunately, it came really late in his life, just before he died. But we were out at, uh, at a Sufi uh, gathering in Marin County. 
and there was an old kind of smoky piano up right out there, and uh, Shabda Khan, I don't know if you're Shabda Khan, he's a good friend, and he's also a ragga singer, and he's a Sufi peer, he teaches Sufism, uh, asked me to accompany Pandit Pranath on this piano, and he sang Darbari, and, uh, but by this time, he had heart failure, so, he wasn't the singer. He, you know, he had to, try, had to stop to breathe. And still, it's very, very moving to hear, you know. But but it's mainly just like his voice is almost like a shadow of a voice, you know. Did you get a recording of that? Yeah, there's a recording of it. Oh. Yeah. I guess I'd love to hear about some of the history. The philosopher's hand is such a great piece. Yeah. That's a raga, actually. The, the, when David Herring, I, I think maybe the story is even written down somewhere in there, but you know, he asked me if you thought about Pandit Pranath, what would you, he came out and we were at Skywalker and we had just recorded, uh, what did we record? Requiem for Adam, I think. And then, what, isn't that the recording? And we had a little time and Judith Sherman says, you know, Let's fill this out. And I had, while we were out there, I, I actually recorded during that period uh, uh, about uh, two hours of music. And David just reminded me of that improvisations on the Skywalker piano, piano out there. But at the end of the session, David said, we need about, uh, you know, we'd like to have, an, I don't know, five, eight, however long it is, eight minutes. And he, he came out and sat with, beside the piano and said, you know, when you think of Pandit Pranath, uh, what would you play? So, uh, Raga Darbari is one of Pandit Pranath's specialties, you know. So I was trying to play the feeling of Raga Darbari. Can you show us what a Raga Darbari is? Well, the scale is uh, on the piano. transcribed it, it's difficult because there's things that you, that are, when you transcribe them, pianists then will emphasize those parts, but they're not the important parts. So it's really good if you know what the raga is, you know. piano doesn't have in between the notes. Why is it that it gets so deep inside? I, it's just it's, it's mysterious. Because it's been done for th you know, thousands of years and the transmission of the music has been continuous and many people have worked on it. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, that's where music is a spiritual art. It's in the air, it's, it's in the and we're all part of it. We're all part of the web. So that's why we feel it. If we open ourselves, you know, to it. Yeah. <laughs> 